I'm Lizanne Saunders. And I'm Kathy Jones. And this is On Investing, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Each week, we analyze what's happening in the markets and discuss how it might affect your investments. Well, hi, Lizanne. We had a big day last Friday with the jobs report, way above expectations, a real surprise. What did you make of that? Yeah, I mean, it was nothing short of gangbusters, pretty much across the board, And it wasn't just the much stronger payrolls release, which was up 254,000. Expectations were in the 150 to 160. The 254, uh, Bloomberg tracks ranges of estimates by economists, and it was well above even the highest estimate that they tracked as part of the monthly survey that they do. Also, we had positive revision to the prior month's data, and that bucked the trend recently of mostly downward revisions. And then one additional note, maybe this is getting a little bit in the weeds, but I think more and more people are aware of the fact that the Bureau of Labor Statistics does two surveys every month, one called the Establishment Survey, from which the payrolls number is generated, and then the Household Survey, from which the unemployment rate is generated. And there has been a huge, uh, I don't know, it's like two and a half million payrolls gap between what the establishment survey has suggested payrolls growth has been over the last couple of years versus the household survey. And there was an assumption by many economists that if anything, you were going to see payrolls catch down to the household survey. But at least with last week's release, you saw a huge jump in the household measure of employment too. And the fact that it was a a muted change to the labor force participation rate, that helps to explain why the unemployment rate ticked down in this most recent leash, which was also not expected. So there was very, very little you could quibble with within the data. If you wanted to nitpick, hours worked, came down a little bit, and long-term unemployment ticked up a little bit. But it was really hard to find much fault with that data. And and clearly, there was a lot of action in your world, Kathy, with the continued move up in yields uh, pretty much across the board. So maybe share your thoughts on what has happened in the bond market and the obvious change in expectations with regard to Fed policy. Yeah, uh, bond yields for both two-year and 10-year maturities are now back to 4%, which we haven't seen since August. So we've done this round trip back to higher levels. And and that reflects clearly the strength of the economy and that shift in expectations about what the Fed's going to do. Some of this started earlier when we had the GDP report that showed, oh, economic growth was actually pretty healthy at 3% in the last quarter. And we've run four quarters now in a row, averaging about 3%, which is a pretty healthy growth rate for an economy this late in the cycle. I, I don't even know where we are in the cycle, but uh, <laughs> this long after the last recession, let's put it that way, pretty healthy growth rate. And then you get the jobs numbers with the revisions. It seems to say, oh, okay, things are running along at a much better rate than we had anticipated. And I think now the market has to adjust to, well, what does the Fed do with this information? There's a meeting in November. There's another meeting in December. I think that there's a good chance I'll pause in November instead of going ahead and making another rate cut. They may sit back and say, well, things are looking pretty good, really, uh, in the economy overall. Let's maybe take a step back and wait for more data and, and look at what we do in December. Although I wouldn't rule out another rate cut because we still have an upper bound in the Fed funds rate at 5%, which is pretty high. And we also have another jobs report between now and the November meeting and a couple of inflation reports, too. So certainly the needle could move a little. Yeah, and I think that's going to be the the big thing is, you know, what is inflation doing while the economy is chugging along at a positive real rate and jobs are growing? The Fed is in what they call risk management mode now. The economy is in a good place, and we should all be really happy about this. I I think that was like some, uh, I looked at social media on Friday, and uh, people seemed that upset about That was your first mistake. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have. But <laughs> I just thought, you know, real earnings are, are growing. The unemployment rate is pretty low at 4%. And inflation is falling and the economy is doing okay. I mean, there are obviously sectors not doing as well like manufacturing and a few others, but 
in general, things are going along pretty well. So if you're at the Fed, what you want to do now is manage the risks up and down around that. You know, you don't want inflation to go up too much. You don't want it to go down too much. It's hovering near 2%. They don't want it to go a lot below that. They don't want the unemployment rate to go up much from here. But if it goes down too much, that might create a shortage of labor and get inflation going again. So now I think it calls for more moderate pace, kind of slow and steady as she goes, looking at the data and making those adjustments, but smaller adjustments, I think, than had been previously anticipated. But look, it's all going to depend on how the inflation and the jobs numbers play out over time. This is one report. One report doesn't a trend make. We hope that we can continue to get good reports like this uh, for the sake of all the people who want jobs, but it's not guaranteed. So we're looking at, you know, a slower pace of Fed rate cuts ending probably between three and three and a quarter percent rather than, you know, two, two and a half percent we've seen in the last couple of cycles. And just a kind of a moderate way of going about this and feeling their way in a risk management mode. So when it comes to yields, you know, we, we've been saying that 10 year was fairly priced right around 380. We're bouncing around up to 4%, which is within kind of a range of tolerance for that kind of a forecast. There really not much likelihood that we're going to see big changes right now until we get more information. But we've got some CPI data and PPI data coming out that might move things a little bit. And then of course, more jobs data. So I think for now, this is just a sideways, try and figure things out as we go along kind of market. It's certainly, I don't think the start of a bear market in the bond market, but a pretty big readjustment to kind of focus on where we are today. And instead of, gee, you know, the sky is falling, unemployment's rising. Now it's, oh, things are pretty good. So yields can just bounce around here for a while. Yeah. And as a reminder, we we touched on it, I think it was last week's show where we, you and I just sort of riffed on the Fed meeting and Fed policy and the moves in yields. And I, I pointed out, and I wanted to reiterate that a Fed that is approaching this at a more moderate pace is not aggressively cutting interest rates. You want to wish for a Fed moving at a more moderate pace based on history anyway, a Fed that is moving more methodically, not aggressively cutting, uh, ostensibly because they're trying to combat a recession or a financial crisis or some combination thereof. Historically, the market's behavior has been much more benign, average maximum drawdowns about less than half as much in a slow moving Fed cycle versus a fast moving Fed cycle. So given where we are right now and what we know right now, a, a Fed that maybe is taking their foot off the accelerator a little bit is not a bad backdrop for the equity market, at least based on history. Yeah, I 100% agree that this is kind of a, a really nice scenario we find ourselves in. And maybe that's what people are having difficulty grappling with. <laughs> you know, we haven't had this for a while. Uh, that said, you know, one and done is very rare. It, it yeah. would be very unusual for the Fed to cut once in a cycle and not cut again. So it, there's more rate cuts probably down the road, but the urgency is not there. So, Lizanne, we have a guest on the show this week. Tell us about him. Sure, I'm excited. It's uh, Paul Hickey. He is the co-founder of Bespoke Investment Group, and he's also the head portfolio manager for Bespoke's Wealth Management Services, and he creates and maintains many of their regular reports. And with his co-founder, Justin Walters, he co-writes the Bespoke Report. It's a newsletter on a weekly basis. I'm a regular reader of that. Paul appears frequently on CNBC, Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio, Fox Business, and his reports and findings and data and great backdrop from a macro and micro perspective have been extensively featured in publications, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Financial Times, Barron's, USA Today, among others. Prior to founding Bespoke, Paul served more than six years as a research analyst for Barini Associates, founded by my friend and the late, great Laszlo Barini. And during that time, he conceived and implemented in-depth and original research projects on domestic and global financial markets for institutional clients. And before his move to Barini, Paul was at Solomon Smith Barney, a couple of names that don't exist anymore, from 1997 to 2000 on the firm's Emerging Markets Fixed Income Structured Products Desk.
So, Paul, thanks again for joining us. I'm thrilled to have you. I have been following your work, as you all know, for many, many years. So it is a treat to have you on as our guest. I'm thrilled to be here, Lizanne. Uh, you know, just to be in the company of such wonderful guests you and Kathy have had over the last several months and throughout your time doing this, it's uh, really great to be here. So thanks for including me as well. Happy to have you. And it's such a, a breadth of research that Bespoke puts out. So I think maybe the, the best way to approach approach our conversation here is maybe to start bigger picture, and then we can hone in a, a bit more on some of the less evergreen aspects to some of the work that you have done and put out recently. So with that in mind, I wanted to focus in on what are always compelling data points that you and the folks at Bespoke reference, and uh, one of which is around, as you put it, odds that can beat the house and the notion that the longer you play, the better your odds. That is, you know, singing from our, our same tune book, as you probably know. So give us the details behind that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think one of the common misconceptions if people who aren't in the market constantly feel is that the market is stacked against them and that, you know, the big guys have the advantage. But when you look at it for an individual investor, as long as you're willing to have the time in the market, you can really increase your odds of beating the house, so to speak. Over the course of any given day, it's basically like a coin flip as to whether or not the market's going to be higher or lower. But then if you go out like a month, it's about 60%. Over the course of a year, your odds of being ahead in the market are about three and four. And then as you go out over time, those odds steadily increase. And as you go out to 16 years, there's never been a period in US stock market history where the market has been down over a 16-year period. So uh, we tend to call it the Joe Montana rule, uh, given his number 16. And so that's something we try and reinforce to individual investors and to wealth management clients that you too can beat the house. Whereas if you go to a casino, a sports betting app, you're likely going to lose your money. But if you stay with the stock market and stick with the plan, you can end up ahead. Music to my ears. And of course, I know that history around 16. And maybe it's because I'm a girl, although I'm also a sports fan. I was Joe Montana fan. I, I thought, oh, sweet 16, another definition of that. But music to our ears, as you I guess would know, we spent a lot of time at Schwab talking to our investors about reigning in emotions-based decision-making and, and thinking over a long time horizon certainly helps that process. And you have some really interesting stats associated with that. So talk about the difference between owning the U.S. stock market. If you take it to a granular level, it makes a really important point between owning the stock market on the day after up days versus owning it the day after down days. Right. And so going back, I love your, uh, you're calling it a sweet 16, uh, being a dad of uh, four daughters, uh, my oh. third one who just had her 16th wow. birthday. So I've done three sweet 16s already. And so I have one more. So in, in that respect, I like that sweet 16 analogy. But getting to your point, you know, when you go on CNBC or something, Lizanne, I'm sure on a big up day that people say, is it time to get in? On a yep. big down day, should we sell and take our profits? Yep. Those two questions may be the two worst pieces of advice you could possibly take. Here, here. So if you just look back in the market, if you only had exposure to the S&P 500, this is going back to 1993, if you only had exposure to the market the day after an up day, you'd be up 14%. Not 14% annualized, but 14% over that entire time period. Now, if you did the opposite and only had exposure on a day after a down day, you'd be up closer to around 750% since 1993. So it just goes to the idea that your emotions and the market don't mix and you have to keep those separated. You know, you're better off just, you know, flushing your money down the toilet <laughs> than, than letting your, your emotions get the best of you. And another point, you know, we have an election coming up in November and, you know, talking about politics is the worst possible thing. So I'm just going to keep it high level here. But... <laughs> Back in 2008, when President Obama was elected, I had so many conversations with people who said, I'm taking my money. I'm not putting my money in the market because Obama's a socialist. He's going to tank the market. Then in 2016, Trump was elected and you had a whole different set of people saying, I don't want to be involved in the market. Trump's going to destroy the economy. So if you look back over history, 
If you had been long the S&P 500, this goes back to like World War II, if you had invested $1,000 only when Republicans were in office, you'd have about $27,000 today. If you were only invested when and had exposure when Democrats were in office, you'd have about $55,000 today. So first of all, before you say, oh, Democrats are better than Republicans, Democrats have been in office longer than Republicans. So that explains some of the difference. And the annualized returns are basically identical for Republicans versus Democrats. So neither party has an edge, newsflash. But if you had been exposed, if you just had exposure in the market in 1945 and you just kept that $1,000 invested over the long term, you wouldn't have $27,000. You wouldn't have $55,000. You'd have like $3 million. <laughs> so to let your emotions and your political beliefs get the best of you is just, you know, don't want to do it. I'm so glad you said that. My colleague, Kevin Gordon, and I is on my team. We wrote an election-related piece a week ago, and we have very similar stats. We did it in growth of $10,000 variety, and we did it starting in 1948 and carrying through. And same numbers, but on a different scale. Right. $311,000 is what 10000 turned into under Republican presidents, turned into $1.2 million under Democratic presidents but it turned into almost $38 million <laughs> if you just had it in the market. And I always say, I don't know about anybody else, I'm taking the $38 million and letting <laughs> the 1.2 and the 300 battle it out for some weird form of supremacy. But I'm fascinated because I love that. Not that anybody should trade by only being in the market the day after a down day or vice versa, but it really drives home the point about staying in the market and some of the emotions that kick in with regard to timing. And I also love that you push back on the whole get in, get out. Uh, probably the most common question I get by the media when it's one of those tumultuous days or weeks is, okay, Lizanne, are you telling your clients to get in or get out? And I think, what a stupid question. <laughs> because neither get in nor get out is an investing strategy. It's just gambling on two moments in time. And that is not, I, I don't know about you, but I've never met any successful investor that got there with that get in, get out, especially when it's emotions based. Another hot button issue in the current environment, and, and one that I think does spark emotions and certainly is tied to this very unique cycle and what the Federal Reserve has been up to, is the inflation backdrop. And I find that that is still top of mind for investors when I go out on the road and speak. But I know our, our listeners would be interested in why you refer to the stock market specifically as inflation's kryptonite. Yeah. So, I mean, I think when you look back at history, the purchasing power of $1,000 in, again, 1945 is worth less than $100 today. So you've lost 90% of your value of that $1,000. So if you put your money under a mattress in 1945, it's a lot smaller nest egg that you have now. We were just talking about having exposure to the S&P 500 buy and hold from 1945 on, and you'd have something like $3 million today. I was looking at a newspaper ad from 1945, and a dozen eggs was 35 cents. 25 pounds of flour was $1.20, and a new car averaged about $1,000, depending on whether it was a nice car or you know an economy type car. Today, a dozen eggs is about $5 a dozen. A pound of flour is a dollar, not 25 pounds for a dollar. And a car is about 50000 so that $1,000 in 1945 would have bought you 10 cars. That same $1,000 in the stock market today is over $3 million. And even though a car is 50000 you could buy, I mean, I, I, what's the math? I think it's 800 cars today with that money. So inflation is a killer of wealth when you're sitting in cash. But when you have that money invested, you can really offset the impact. And while high inflation is bad for the stock market. We saw it in 2022, especially high growth stocks. In the long run, stocks are also somewhat of a hedge against inflation because as you have inflation, revenues are, of companies are going up and that you know, on a nominal basis, it increases company revenues and hence earnings per share over time. So you know, there's no better inflation hedge than the stock market over the long term. Yeah, couldn't agree more. So let's leave the so-called evergreen forest and come a little more into the here and now. You recently put out a really interesting report that was just a somewhat simple pros and cons for the equity market. Um, I will point out at the outset, for what it's worth, your pros list is longer than your cons list. So I think on the surface, that's a, 
a good thing. But I was hoping you could highlight in your mind what are some of the most compelling or significant factors on each of those lists. Yeah. So, I mean, I think from my perspective, I like to get the the bad news first. So as far as the the market is concerned, when we look at what's going on with the market perspective now, some of the big worries, first of all, you have valuations. Valuations by any stretch of the imagination aren't cheap. You can say the market's very expensive, or if you look at the median stock, you can say that it's somewhat reasonable, but it's hard to say that the market is cheap. Every sector, I think with the exception of energy, is trading in the 80th percentile or more of its 10-year PE range. So the market's not cheap. Whenever we do this report over the last few years, valuations have always been a con. And that brings home the point, though, that valuations are one of the worst timing tools you can have in investing. So it's always a con. It's always something to be concerned about. I like to say is that Valuations are more of, say, gasoline. You need a spark to get that going. So even if the market's cheap, the market's not going to rally because the market's cheap unless there's a catalyst and vice versa. And, you know, related to that, it's often why I also say that valuation is almost a sentiment indicator or an indicator of sentiment. Yeah, great point. Um, And and part of the reason why it's not a good market timing tool because valuations can get rich and stay rich for an extended period of time and vice versa. So I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, I I think that's a great point. It's a reflection of sentiment. And sentiment right now, it depends on what you look at. Investor sentiment measures are very bullish. Some are not so much. You look at strategists, uh, most strategists, even after raising their price targets for the S&P this year, are still below where the market is or on a median basis. So sentiment's one. I think the biggest issue right now and and one that I wouldn't even begin to try and handicap is the geopolitical situation and what's going on in the Middle East. You have a situation where nobody knows how that's going to play out, and it could impact the price, you know, it, we've seen it have some of an impact on oil prices already. And, you know, the higher oil prices go, we saw that again in, in 2022, the Russia-Ukraine war, when we saw oil go to, you know, back up to $100 a barrel, what that caused as far as economic impact and sentiment towards inflation. So I think the geopolitical issue is something you don't want to necessarily dismiss, you want to focus on it and, and be aware of it. And then, you know, another one that we look for more timely here is the month of October. You know, we got, we got through September and everyone's like, yeah, you know, the worst months behind us and everything back to the best three month period in history for the stock market. So that's true. And as you know, market bottoms tend to occur in the month of October, but in order to get a market bottom, you have to see market weakness. And, um, you know, if you just look back through history, the month of October has had the biggest average peak to trough declines of any other month of the year. So it's still early in the month. So, you know, I wouldn't necessarily dismiss the potential for a pullback. You have years just from a seasonal perspective in the years where the S&P has been up 20% through the first three quarters. It's just a statistical anomaly, perhaps, but seven out of those 10 Octobers were down. Hey, Paul, can I ask you a follow-on question sure. to that? Do you know what month is the opposite? Does it by nature sort of follow it? Is it November where it's the largest trough to peak? Um, So the frequency of 5% drawdowns is the lowest in December, and then April is the second lowest. Okay, that makes sense. 14 and 15%. Great. So yeah, so those, those months are the months that you tend to see the most calm in the market. And peak volatility, you tend to see that in October. We have earnings season coming up, which can always increase volatility, and you have the two hurricanes, you have Helene and you have Milton. So, you know, hurricanes throughout history, and I hate to like talk about them from a market related perspective, but throughout history, the impact on the markets has tended to be short term. Geopolitical issues can cause a recession, but not many recessions have been caused by weather events, but they can be catastrophic on a certain region of the country. Before you get on to the pros, let me just ask you one more question with regard to one of the cons that you mentioned on geopolitics. So the work that you have done in terms of if and when something geopolitical, a crisis, an eruption of something turns into something more protracted and and has a, a longer lasting impact on the market in one direction or another, is it usually because of what feeds through the energy markets, the oil price channels? Is it commodity price related or is it just the general uncertainty and the malaise associated with that? 
I think it's more the energy side of the situation, uh, but <laughs> wars can have a big impact on investor psyche as well. But oil prices, you know, again, we saw it in early 2022, 70s, the oil price shocks because of geopolitical issues. It typically came down to oil. And even though we are less energy reliant of an economy today, although that may be changing with as everything becomes electrified and AI, but energy prices are one of the heads of the three-headed monster that we call energy prices, the dollar, and interest rates. So when those are all rising in unison, it tends to be bad news for the markets. And when they're falling and near lows like they were just recently, it tends to be good for market returns going forward. And then the last con I almost left off was uh, semiconductors. They're the transports of the 21st century, we call them. And they're a great leading indicator in this electrified economy and information economy. And they've also been a great leading indicator for the market. And on a relative basis, they peaked ahead of the market in the summer, just starting to see that downtrend since the summer starting to break. And I think NVIDIA just recently was making its first higher high in close to four months. So semiconductor weakness is more of a potential con for the broader technology sector or the overall market, or, or, or maybe they're just so related that it's one and the same. Yes, that's a great point. So what we've done is when we've you know looked at it in the past, so going back over you know probably since like the iPhone era, 2007, when we became more of a mobile and digital economy, you tend to see major peaks in the relative strength of the semiconductors versus the S&P 500. You would see that peak or trough oftentimes ahead of the market. So that's um, one of the things that we've been watching as a potential con. So that's the bad news. Some of the good news is, uh, I think, you know, the first respect is the Fed. The Fed is now our friend. That's great to hear that we may not be getting a 50 basis point cut at the next meeting. But I, I think just as far as the Fed is concerned, when the market isn't worried at every economic report, whether the Fed's going to hike or not, especially after what investors have gone through over the last two years, that is a not an all clear, but it's less of a roadblock for the market. Now, would the Fed stay on your pros list if, let's say, we get a hotter set of inflation readings this week as we're taping this? It predates the release of CPI or PPI and or another very strong jobs report. Let's say we're heading to a Fed that opts, at least at the November meeting, to not do anything, not cut rates, go back into some version of pause mode. Do you still think the path of least resistance is down and would that stay on your pros list or would you reconsider? So we would still consider it as a pro until we started hearing guidance from Fed officials that, oh, we may have messed up. Uh, we shouldn't have cut last month. We should probably think about taking back at least 25 basis points of that. That would bring it back to a con. We have one thing we call our Fed speak monitor where we take every Fed official's public comments as well as the beige book and Fed statements. And we go through them and we qualitatively rank them, whether it's a dovish, hawkish, or neutral statement. And in the last several weeks, that FedSpeak monitor showed the most dovish central bank commentary since 2021, when they were still talking about, or not even thinking about, thinking about hiking rates. So for now, the Fed is a positive, but it's not just the Federal Reserve. It's We're in a global easing cycle right now. 19 central banks around the world, their last rate change was a cut. So you know, the U.S., you could argue maybe the, the U.S. doesn't necessarily need lower interest rates, but you look at China, you look at Europe, the rest of the world economy isn't doing great. But if you have those central banks easing policy, at least some of that's going to bleed over to the U.S., even if the Fed stays on hold. So that's one of the pros. And then the economy, you know, usually the Fed is easing because the economy is not doing great. And when you look at the economy right now, it's, you know, and, and some of your prior shows, you know, one of the key things we always hear is that this economy is so difficult to navigate. And it's so crazy to the fact that we're cutting rates in an environment where the stock market's at highs. And, you know, we see such conflicting signals between manufacturing and services, even within manufacturing, whether it's surveys or hard data, uh, we're getting different vibes. So the economy, the growth scare that ever, we all had in early September when the Fed shifted its focus from inflation to employment 
Well, it's starting to look like a lot of that could have been a statistical anomaly. So the jobs market isn't as strong as it was two years ago. And I think that's more of a good thing than a bad thing because employers couldn't find people to hire. At, the, at least we're starting to get some equilibrium. So if you look at the City Economic Surprise Index, that's turned positive after several months negative. And another, when we track just the momentum of indicators on their year-over-year basis, and the majority of them this month for the first time in five months actually showed improvements in their year-over-year readings versus deterioration. So they weren't all positive, but they were getting less worse. And I assume you're, as it relates to the combination of the economy and the Fed, I assume you're in the for the most part, good news is good news camp. Yes, without a doubt. And that we shouldn't be wishing for terrible news. We shouldn't be wishing for a Fed that has to step up and get much more aggressive with rate cuts because of the backdrop of what that would suggest. I know that's the camp we're in, that we're in a good news is good news. And be careful what you wish for if you're hoping for really weak economic news. Yeah. And I think ever since uh, last December, when, um, you know, December 2023, it's when the Fed was signaled that they were done um, hiking rates, that we've almost been in that environment. And I think a 50 handle on an ISM manufacturing would be great. It's been long enough since we've had one. But, uh, you know, I think that would be a good thing to see, just to see some stabilization and, and growth in the manufacturing sector, because it's been so weak for so long. And then it would also show that maybe some more private sector activity. Uh, One of the factors keeping this economy so strong relative to other global economies is, you know, they say don't fight the Fed, but, you know, you also don't want to fight the the Feds. Uh, You know, if you're you're in a conflict with the government, the government has unlimited uh, resources to sue you and it's hard to win. And if the government wants to keep the economy from going into recession, they have a lot of resources to do that. And we've seen that in uh, a lot of fiscal spending over the last uh, two years. Years. Whatever the longer term ramifications, we can debate that. But in the short term, it's been an economic pro. And then the last pro, I mean, there's plenty others, but I think one of the more interesting ones is how we've seen the handoff in breadth from the MAG7 to the rest of the market. September was the first month in this entire bull market since um, it started in October 2022 that the S&P hit a new high and the tech sector didn't hit a new high. And um, if you go back to the July highs before we had the pullback in August, the S&P, as you know, is up about 1%. The average stock is up over 3%. So we've seen a big handoff in other sectors picking up the slack. Yeah, and equal weight having outperformed yeah. the cap-weighted S&P in the third quarter. That was a big shift. Yeah. You know, in the first half, that was a big complaint towards the market that it was just the MAG-7. And now, <laughs> you know, some of the skeptics are saying, well, the MAG-7 aren't doing anything. So this market is in trouble because if those other stocks fall, then we're in trouble. Well, of course. But, you know, as of now, they've picked up the slack. And and that's something that people were, were very worried about. The fact that we were hitting new highs and, and of the MAG-7, only Meta was hitting new highs. I think that was impressive. Yeah. And I think that one of our themes, and I'll see if you agree, is that this broadening out the rotation, some of the leadership shifts probably has legs beyond just what was a third quarter period of outperformance by equal weight and some profit taking up uh, the cap spectrum. But we've been saying probably has legs and fits and starts that there's still probably money that wants to find its way back into tech and comp services and the MAG-7. So do you think this broadening out, these leadership rotations are likely to persist? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, Nothing steady, but when you have central bank policy around the world on an easing, more of an easing posture, that's going to benefit cyclicals. So I, I think in that respect, that bodes well. And as we touched on earlier, one of the biggest cons in the market is valuations. But on a median basis, they're much more reasonable. And when you go to these non-tech stocks, non-mega cap stocks, there's a lot more reasonable valuations there. So people can shift into those areas and have a little bit more comfort. And one of the things that just blew my mind the first time I saw it a couple of years ago, and, and still it's hard, you know, people just are always fascinated by it, is that the the Russell 2000s market cap is basically the size of Apple. It's a little bit higher now, but if the MAG-7 we looked at one point, if they collectively pulled back 5%, it would have been like a 20% rally in, in the Russell 2000. And that's what we saw in the summer. Remember that huge surge we had when the Russell traded over four standard deviations above its 
50-day moving average. It was the most overbought reading for a major U.S. index in history on a short-term basis. And you know, it's, it's that kind of shift when you see just a little bit of money from the big pool goes into the kiddie pool, it's going to start to cause things to overflow. And um, you can get those big moves. But what we looked at when we found similar types of real sharp moves like that, you tended to see some short-term weakness because after all, you when you go to the most overbought reading in history, you're bound to see some profit taking. But it usually marked a significant shift where they tended to do well over the course of the next year. All right. Uh, not that any of us have uh, a clear crystal ball, so I'm not going to ask you for any kind of market <laughs> prediction. But if I said to you that uh, I've just come from the future and I can tell you that one of your lists, either your pros or cons, is going to get longer in the next few months, which list is it? I think I would go with the pros list. Uh, you know, again, I like the bad news first, but longer term, we're optimists. We, you know, we're bullish on America. It's been the right bet for the last 250 years almost now. So I, I think in that respect, you can't go wrong betting on America and the U.S. economy and how strong it has been and how strong it's likely to continue being. Yeah, well, music to my ears and I think our ears. And I'm, I'm glad for the purposes of a podcast that you went with the cons first and the pros second, because that way we get to end on a positive note. So there you go. Um, like I said, I love your work and your firm's work and I'm thrilled that you agreed to come on and share your wisdom with us. So thanks for joining us. And again, thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure being on with you, Lizanne. And um, you know, hopefully we get to do it again sometime in the future. I'm sure we will. Thanks so much. All right. Great. Thanks. Well, a lot of great insights there, Lizanne. Thank you. So looking ahead to next week, it's the middle of October. The port strike has been averted, but we have a number of other things going on in the world that can cause some turmoil. What are the economic indicators that you're watching most closely? Yeah, so before touching on the the indicators that are top of mind for me, it's also the case that we'll celebrate, I guess for most investors, a two-year anniversary of this most recent bull market. And I wouldn't be surprised to see that garner a lot of attention for what it's worth. Bull markets that have historically lasted two years, more often than not, tend to go on for a third year, albeit with muted returns, typically relative to some of the stronger returns that have marked the first year or two of a bull market. So I would expect to see a lot of commentary. In fact, our next report may indeed be a bit of a look back at this bull market uh, so far. But in terms of the economic data. I've talked a lot about the regional Fed PMIs that I think increasingly have garnered some attention in addition to the national readings on PMIs. The PMIs is just short for purchasing managers indexes. You've got the ISM version of those for both manufacturing and services. And also S&P Global has a version of those as well. But the regional Fed surveys, both on manufacturing and services, can sometimes grab attention. You've got the Empire data coming out next week, and that has been a notably strong regional Fed survey relative to many of the others. We also get mortgage applications and given moves now both down and up in a measure like the 10-year yield, which tracks mortgage rates. I think data or anything uh, housing related is important. In fact, in the end of the week, we get the NAHB housing market index and we get both housing starts and building permits. In addition to Empire, we get the Philly Fed. Probably the biggest report next week is uh, retail sales. So I, I think that may capture some attention. We also get weekly claims as we try to gauge truly what the path is for the uh, labor market. I think weekly claims can provide some nuggets there. What about you, Kathy? What's on your radar? Well, yeah, all those economic indicators will be important. And I think particularly the retail sales, because, you know, what's powering this economy and preventing it from really slowing down is that consumer spending and consumers have jobs and therefore they're spending and therefore the economy is growing. So that's going to be important to see what the strength of that is. We have a lot of Fed officials speaking and I'll be paying attention to what they're trying to communicate in those speeches, because given everything that's gone on since the meeting and now with the jobs data, it will be interesting to see what the perspective is of various members, because if you remember the dot plot where they all 
provide us with information about where they see the policy rate going over time. Although we track the median estimate, there's a wide range, a big dispersion among the various members as to how fast they think the Fed should go and how far they think the Fed should go in cutting rates. So it'll be really interesting, I, I hope, to hear what these various perspectives are. That'll give us a feeling about what exactly is the Fed keyed in on right now in terms of rate changes. So that's it for us this week. Thanks for listening. As always, you can keep up with us in real time on social media. I'm at Kathy Jones. That's Kathy with a K on X and LinkedIn. And if you've enjoyed the show, we'd be grateful if you'd leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, a rating on Spotify, or feedback wherever you listen. You can also follow us for free in your favorite podcasting app. And I'm at Lizanne Saunders on X and LinkedIn. I am not on Facebook. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on WhatsApp. Be mindful of that because there have been a rash of imposters and they seem to be escalating again, particularly into WhatsApp. I don't run a private stock picking club, so don't get duped. Make sure you're following the actual me. And also you can find all of our research, our written reports, any videos that we might do on schwab.com forward slash learn. It, you don't have to be actually a client. If you know how to put that in a search field, you can find all of our uh, work on schwab.com as well. Next week, I'll be speaking with fixed income expert, Carol Spain. So stay with us for that. For important disclosures, see the show notes or visit schwab.com slash on investing, where you can also find the transcript.